So welcome everyone to the first meeting of our ITC scaling class for fall 2017. Um, just real quick, almost all of you have been in a class of mine already, so you know uh, how the class works and what the deal is, so we don't spend a lot of time with that. Uh, one of the things I want you to be aware of is in Moodle, everyone got their Moodle assignment completed, their introductory assignment. Uh, and like our other class, the Moodle is simply for you to jump through to get to the Netacad or the netlabs.scaling.edu. Uh, if you want to just bookmark those, you can do that too. I just ask that uh, every day, uh, every week or so, you go into the course once uh, on Moodle just to prove, quote, attendance. Um, that way we'll be able to, uh, uh, we'll be able to uh, prove attendance, even though I know the majority of you will be doing all your, well, you will be doing all your work in netacad.com. So I'm actually going to close Moodle because it's not really that important for us anymore at this point. Um, where we're going to need to be at is here. We're going to be in your scaling class. Uh, it's ITC Scale uh, Fall 17. Um, this is a really neat class and a good class. It's also the first time I've taught the new 6.0 class. Um, so we're going to get a chance to all go through this together. Um, it's really kind of just bringing back in items that have been removed uh, from uh, the Cisco uh, curriculum in the past, and now it's back. So it's uh, not really all that new in terms of this material. And we'll get to connecting. Connecting, the final course has some some pretty different things in it. Um, so it will be a, a little bit different once we get into it. So, But just like before, we have our modules. Underneath modules, uh, each one of the chapters has packet tracers. Uh, first off, obviously, the reading under the loss of the chapter. We then have packet tracers and labs. Uh, again, don't freak out when you see 27 packet tracers. Uh, what I'd like you to do is do as many of them as you can, but at a minimum, do one to two of them. Uh, I really would like to see you do two if you can of each of the packet tracers. In fact, Pick something that you have trouble with and do those two if you can't get all of them done. Um, it's always preferred that you do all of them, but I know that's not going to be completely possible with the packet tracers. However, I am asking you to do all of the labs. Um, so the hands-on labs, which you know are actually completed inside of NetLabs. I had a giant bomb up and running. Uh, inside of NetLabs, so I'm looking at this troubleshooting inter VLAN routing lab. Uh, I want you to do all of those labs. And remember again to please use the content from inside the NetLabs lab because they are sometimes modified to fit NetLabs. And if you try to run the Word document from inside of Netacad, because I know I have a link to it right here, because there's troubleshooting, and we do have the, the document that you can fill out, um, you know, that, that's uh, form fillable. If you try to use this particular um, item to actually run through the lab, you may have issues because it hasn't been uh, designed to be used or to be um, um, put onto the uh, NetLab system. So please make sure you use the NetLab's uh, show lab content. Now still, I want you to fill out the forms, you know, type in your messages, save it. Remember too with these PDFs to save it, download it, and save it. Uh, then open it, then make your changes. If you don't, you could end up with uh, uh, it not saving the things that you type in, and that's very, very aggravating. Um, the questions on those labs. Again, remember, we've got packet tracers, which I want you to do at least one to two of those. I'd love for you to do them all, but at least one to two per chapter. And then all of the written labs, or all the hands-on labs you need to do. Um, and those hands-on labs are to be completed on our NetLab system. Any questions on that? Pretty similar, exactly like what we've done in our last two courses. Um, so no difference there. I do want you to do the, all the chapter exams. They are required. And then at the end, you will also have a written final exam and you will have a hands-on final exam that must be completed inside of um, NetCAD. Uh, excuse me, netlabs.com. All right. And I'm going to pull the chat down so I can see it. Too. Okay. So that sounds good. All right. Excellent. Um, there is a pretest here. I'd like you to do it too. So I, I've turned on all the uh, chapter exams. Uh, the chapter exams, I uh, do them just like before in that I don't uh, really use them as a, uh, even though I do give you a grade for them, I let you take them up to 10 times a piece. So they're more for you to learn not necessarily just for a, a, a grading item. They're more for you to learn what's uh, what's in the chapters and to get the concepts and the and the ideas down. How you use them in your classroom is your own business, but that's how I use them inside of the ITC courses. All right, 
So uh, I'm going to go ahead and start on chapter one. Uh, go ahead and do us a lecture on it. Uh, we're going to talk about in a network on or a uh, entire class on scaling. Uh, we're going to talk about scaling networks. And in other words, we're going to look at why do we need to scale a network. Um, one of the truths that I've always known is that if you've got five computers today, you'll have ten tomorrow. Um, you know, I actually started thinking the other day. I was doing a, a, a networking essentials kind of a first day class up in Virginia Beach with some instructors and was talking with them about the number of items in my house that have IP addresses. And, you know, it used to be just, you know, two two computers, um, maybe a TV, but now it's two computers, two phones, a uh, laptop, uh, which is a third computer, a, you know, both DVRs, my TV, um, blink camera system, which is five cameras, so there's five IP addresses, printer, so I used to have four or five devices just in my house. Now I've got probably 15 to 20 devices. Yeah, the Internet of Things, exactly. It's all over my house. Um, so the ability to scale those things are very, very important. And it's the same for a company. How easy would it be if you bought another company uh, and you added on branches like they're doing here? And that's what scalability is all about. It's designing a network so that it can move and not move, just grow uh, and support the business needs as those needs change. One of the ways and a very common model that is used out there, um, this was uh, in one of Lars Lar Lar Chapel's um, books, but it's called hierarchical design model. And it's where you try to design your network to have three layers, C, D, A, or core distribution and access. You have this core layer, and this core layer is all about high-speed switching and routing at wire speed if you're doing multi-layer uh, multi switching like they're doing here. So the core is all about speed and uh, very fast movement of data. The distribution layer is about aggregation of data, uh, security controls, VLANs, those types of things. And then the access layer is just to provide access for end devices onto um, the network itself. Now, you'll look at this. This is a pretty uh, redundant network, which is part of scalability also. You'll notice there are redundant links from each access layer switch up to the distribution, uh, redundant links from the distribution to the core layer, and then aggregated ports from on the, in the core layer. Um, the problem here is when you look at building a network like this, now, for bigger businesses, you know, it, it's, it's feasible. Now, if these are 60, let's say 6,800 series switches, um, those switches are, uh, I don't know, $100,000 a piece, $150,000 a piece. That's 300 grand just their core. You go down to your distribution, you've got, uh, you know, the, the 3,700 series, 3,800. You know, you've still got some money here. But if you are really a small organization, this is not realistic. It's not realistic for at my wife's business with 10 computers to build a network with this type of design. So they do have a thing like a collapsed core, and this is where you collapse the distribution and the access layers, uh, excuse me, the distribution and the, the core layers, and then the access layers are still down here. And you can even have it collapse more depending on how small your network is. Um, this is still would not be cheap because you're looking at say two uh, 3700 or, or 3800 series switches uh, right here. And that wouldn't be cheap, but it's cheaper than doing this. So when are you going to have all three and when are you only going to have two? Uh, it depends on money. It depends on what your network needs. How much uh, redundancy do you need? How much reliability do you need on your network? So here's scalability. Um, you know, when we design for scalability, we want expandable equipment. So we can use many times we look at doing, especially the core, um, modular switches, and we'll show you those in a minute where you can slide in line cards. Um, we look at using uh, hierarchical technologies such as Ether Channel that lets you do what's called bandwidth aggregation. So putting uh, links together to appear as uh, two uh, or one big link instead of two smaller speed links. We do things uh, like using IP addressing schemes that allow us to break our network into manageable chunks. We use routing protocols that allow us to do the same thing to build a hierarchical design such as OSPF, which allows us to build these types of networks. 
And then we also have to think about building to where we can go out to certain points and replace different technologies. Um, you know, so if you've got a wireless uh, GEN now and you want to put in AC or whatever else, the next thing is, how do we fix that so that we can put that in easily on our network? So again, here's redundancy, looking at multiple paths. Uh, one of the things we'll talk a great deal about in this class is spanning tree. And what happens is, by default, switches do not um, block broadcast. So if you did not have what is called spanning tree on these links, if a broadcast went out, it would go out all ports except the one it came in on. So what spanning tree allows you to do is to eliminate layer two loops. We'll do a, an entire chapter on that. So don't, don't worry about that right now. Just spanning tree prevents layer two loops. So we'll, we'll learn how it works and how it does that. Uh, as we move forward. We try to also limit failure domain. So we try to design our network so if a device goes down, we can isolate only one section. Now this is not extremely good here, but you'll notice that instead of putting everything on one switch, we've designed it so that if this switch goes down, it's only gonna affect the top portion. If this switch goes down, it only affects this portion. Whole router goes down, everything goes down. Um, so you just kind of try to figure out a way to um, limit single uh, points of failure and make it where that you have the ability to, to recover from a single point of failure. And again, it comes down to money. You know, can you afford redundant internet links? Can you afford redundant edge routers? Um, we'll talk about the first hop redundancy protocol for HSRP uh, being one of those hot standby routing protocol. Now you can put in dual routers and and have uh, a uh, first hot redundancy program uh, working. Ether channel, this is a technology we will teach you how to do also, but basically we can take two one gig links, combine them in an ether channel, and they appear to be a two gig link to the switches. So this prevents spanning tree from blocking one of these links, because instead of seeing this as two separate links, with the ether channel being implemented, it actually sees it as one link for spanning tree, and also one link for sending data, which is very neat. And here's our wireless acti our wireless connectivity, which is always funny because it's really not a wireless LAN, because you've got a wireless AP, but that wireless AP connects back to the LAN with a cable. So it's not really a wireless LAN, but um, it's, it's very similar. Here is a, they're showing you uh, OSPF and how it can be scalable. Um, Single area OSPF, uh, everything is in within one area, area zero. Um, anytime there's a link state change, it would be sent to everyone in that area. Um, there'd be no um, summarization at uh, any borders or anything of that nature. But OSPF supports creating multi-area OSPF. And by doing this and correct summarization, you can actually make it to where network changes in area 51 do not affect area zero and will not affect area one. So you can actually sit down and design your network so that you can control where the route updates will affect. Um, and we'll go all over, we'll go over that completely in, in chapters as we move forward. Um, here's another thing that's kind of no longer, well, other than IPv6 and IPv4. Um, this is where EIGRP supports what's called PDMs, or protocol dependent modules. Um, EIGRP is a distance vector routing protocol uh, that will support both IPv6 and IPv4. It even supports Apple Talk, IP, um, excuse me, uh, IPX, SPX, and others. Of course, nobody cares anymore because all we use is IPv4 and IPv6. But that's a scalable protocol because if you're running EIGRP or OSPF, because OSPF version 3 supports IPv6 too, um, you can move from IPv4 to IPv6 without having to rip out all your gear and change things or change your entire network. So, um, scalable terminology. Protocol with distance vector behaviors. Well, that's EIGRP. It's actually a distance vector routing protocol. Um, alternative, alternative data pathways. That would be redundancy. Multiple Ethernet links combined to single bandwidth channels link aggregation. Also uh, done through Ether channel, by the way. And a protocol which uses the backbone area is OSPF. Ba -ding! Got it right. Remarkable. All right, so here's some more switches. Uh, you can see our 2960s are considered to be access land switches. Um, they're low level switches. 
the data center, we've got modular switches. Okay, so this is a fixed configuration like our 2960s and others. We've got modular configuration switches that let you slide in blades. Okay. Um, Cisco just released the 9000 uh, series switches at, um, at um, Cisco Live this summer, and everybody was flocking around them, looking at them. But these are very good because you can change out the blades to meet new technology needs. And those are, those are designed to be, uh, especially these, more in the core or at a very high level distribution. So let's say you do a distribution uh, in a building, like our building, for instance, has a 6500 switch. And then uh, it goes out to all the PCs in the switch because we have all the PCs in the building because we have you know, over 200 PCs in this one, uh, one building. Um, or you could have one and then have it go out to other um, switches on each individual floor. Data center switches are their Nexus line. They don't talk a great deal about this. Um, they talk about the Catalyst uh, 6500 being one, but the Nexus series is more what they're doing in the data center now. This is a stackable series of switches. I guess it's got some 3750s, uh, which are EOL, but they're stack-wise capable, so you can actually stack them. And when you do this, they appear to be um, they appear to be one switch, one backplane, because they're actually sharing the stack-wise backplane, which is kind of neat. Um, they're also cloud-based switches, and cloud-based switches are some uh, are Meraki switches, which Cisco now owns where the controllers and the configuration are actually be a cloud-based interface. And then as we move on forward, we need to think about some of the things when selecting our switches. So what are we going to do? Uh, well, big things cost always. Switches aren't cheap, so you need to determine that. Port density. How many ports are you going to need? Are you going to need to expand the number of ports? If so, you may, well, you will need to go with some type of either stackable or some type of modular switch that you can slide a new blade in. Um, so do you need power over ethernet? Okay. Um, when you buy a switch, it needs to be PoE capable or not. Uh, you don't want to have to come to your boss and say, we just bought all these new Cisco switches, but now I've got to buy some new ones because we're putting in IP phone and I want to power them from the switches. So you need to think about that when you buy them. Reliability, port speed. I would also say not just port speed, but the back plane speed. You got to be careful when you're buying switches because you're not always comparing apples to apples. Um, if the back plane doesn't support a speed that is the same as all of the interfaces or close, then it doesn't support true wire speed uh, switching because it doesn't have a back plane that can handle it. And that's one of the ways some of the other uh, switches on the market can be cheaper uh, is because they don't support true wire speed switching. And then obviously scalability and frame buffers. So here's port densities. How many ports do you need? Okay, fixed versus uh, modular, which is up to a thousand plus ports, which is that's a big that's a BHS, a big honking switch. Forwarding rates, and again, look, this is this is a 24 port gigabit switch, so it needs to have a backplane that can do 24 gigabits per second of traffic if it wants to do true wire speed switching. The same over here. If this is 48 gig, it needs to be a 48 gig backplane. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay. If it's got 48 gigabit ports and only has a 32 gig backplane forwarding rate, you can't do wire speed. So make sure you're comparing apples to apples when you go to buy switches. PoE, again, we can get power out to our phones, either an external power source or PoE. You also can power access points actually from PoE switch now. Um, and you've been able to do that for some time. So, you, but you need to buy the switch as a PoE switch, okay? And there is a way to actually put PoE pass-through. Um, there's a way to do it, but it can be very aggravating. So just buy your switches with PoE capability uh, if you need it. Same set of multi-layer switching. Um, some, uh, actually 2960s can do some basic uh, multi-layer switching, very basic. Um, but if you're really going to do multi-layer switching, you want to have it to where um, you've got switches that can do true uh, multi-layer switching or routing. They're actually just routing at layer three. Okay. All right. There's packet tracing going to do now. How about router requirements? Really, kind of the same thing. 
uh, a router is going to block broadcast. They implement security. They do logical groupings. But when you go to think about buying a router, you need to think about how many clients does it need support? How many interfaces do I need on it? You know, routers aren't going to have as many interfaces as a switch because you're connecting your um, your end devices to your switches, to your access level switches. So when we look at our designs, you'll notice that, you know, if this is for we decide on the distribution layer being a router, well, our access layers are these two switches, so we only need two ports on the router. So some of the routers we've got, branch routers, the 1900 series, uh, used to be 1800, uh, could be the 29, could be the 4321 that just came out. You've got network edge routers that are a little higher, uh, getting into the higher end routers. Um, trying to think what will be on those seven. We got seven K, uh, Nexus seven K and ours, uh, could do some other Nexus things depending on how, what, how you're routing. And these service provider routers are the big, like well, could be the nine thousand, new 9,000 series two for the network edge. And the service provider routers, these are over a million dollars a piece. These are massive, massive routers designed to move enormous uh, amounts of data uh, through them. And like I said, you'll rarely if ever see one of those, but if you're working on one, they are uh, very expensive pieces of machinery. So here we see it again, 29, these are now the 2900s are going EOL, be five years before they go out of service though, so don't freak out. Um, you, you've got the um, um, 4321s replacing them now. These 2000 series, these are very interesting. Something I was uh, quite uh, shocked to see and to learn about at Cisco, and I just didn't think about it, and I should have. But Cisco has an entire line of routers, switches, firewalls designed to work in industry, in mechanical areas. And in, um, for instance, they've got a firewall that can actually be put on a, a pole um, that is used to control the SCADA control networks for the electrical grid. Um, and that's something I never thought about. So that a, an electric company could, could turn off certain parts of their electric grid remotely. So they don't have to drive all the way out to a pole and do that, which was very, very interesting. Um, but I never thought about before. So that's a whole, whole nother area. We don't even think about how our students having jobs in. Um, but the, the industry, anything doing with SCADA or with power and controls via the network, um, you know, there's, there's an entire field there that we haven't really um, started touching, uh, really. Uh, Cisco CRS, that's the huge carrier routing uh, for data centers and service providers. Big stuff. So, fast performance and high security for data centers, campus, and branch networks. Probably an edge router, Indian delivery, subscriber services, I'd say that. Simple network configuration management LANs and WANs, probably the branch. High capacity with scalability. Uh, I'm going to say that one. I may be wrong on that. If I was right, I thought I might be wrong on that one. But high capacity and scalability. But anything that's huge location wise or huge in terms of subscriber services, that's going to be a service provider router. Now, we'll do an entire section on this managing iOS files, um, but right now we're on release 15, and there's usually a 20-month time frame between extended maintenance releases, and then inside of those releases, they have a train. They give you certain levels, so 12.1.1, 15.1.1, 15.1.2, 15.1.3, uh, thank goodness they've gone with a universal image now to where you just get the universal image and turn on the features you need. Uh, it used to be an absolute nightmare when they had, you know, a service provider in the, uh, in, uh, image. They had a uh, security image. They had a um, UCS image. Just it was it was nuts. Uh, so thankfully now the iOS is a little simpler to use. Now we're going to do a little bit of review. This is very much review. So looking at in band and out of band management. All right, let me stop a second. Any questions so far? I know I'm going fast, but most of this is just review things that you probably already know. Everything good? Yeah, it's got to sound fast, but I'm writing fast. Okay. So, are you okay? Okay. So, out-of-band router management is either, hey, 
Go ahead. So, Doc? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm good. Thank you. You okay? Okay, good. Yeah. Good. All right. So, out of band router management uh, is via the console port with a console cable and a, um, a terminal emulation client such as PuTTY, uh, or the auxiliary port. Uh, which is uh, also an out-of-band management, usually hooking up to a PSTN, which we don't do a whole lot anymore, um, but <clears throat> that would be out-of-band management. In bands, anytime you're coming across the network. So it could be um, SSH to the VTY line uh, or SSH uh, to a direct VTY line on an Ethernet port, or you could be going across the entire IP network. So. We don't want to use Telnet. Telnet is evil. Uh, we, we don't ever want to connect with Telnet. We need to be using SSA. Here's the basic commands on a router. They're going back over those for you again. So host name, putting in the enable secret password, putting passwords on the uh, console line and BQI lines. <clears throat> kind of interesting, they did line BQI 015 on the router when most of the time we just do 04. All this will do is create another um, set of VTY lines up to 15. Uh, we've got IP addresses being assigned to, an inter to the interfaces. We've got the no shutdown command to bring those interfaces up. And then we've got router rep version 2, and we're routing for two networks, the 16 and the 192.168.10.0. So um, this is the same thing we would do anytime we're configuring a router, and these are the basic commands. The only thing they're not really showing here, oh, they do have a banner message of the day, so they do have that there. Um, the other thing they're not showing you is don't forget once you do the configuration to do a copy run start. Um, otherwise, the uh, configuration would not survive reboot because by default, we are always configuring on the um, on the running config, not the startup config. Uh, and so here's show running config and then obviously do a copy run start. Now these are those um, syntax checkers that have you set the host name. So you actually have to type in the entire thing and you have to put in a host name, R1. And so you got to go enable. There's no shortcuts allowed on here, uh, which is good because you learn the commands, but it can be aggravating. Remember, if you ever don't know what the command is, click show me and it will show you. And then you can just have it bounce through in that way you will know what it's asking for in case you don't know what the command is. But these are good just to do general practice within the uh, within the lab itself, or excuse me, within the curriculum itself without having to bounce out to a lab. Some of the better show commands, my favorite is show IP interface, uh, show IP interface brief right here. Uh, again, it tells you your IP address, tells you the status uh, this is layer one status. This is layer two status. Um, you'll never have up or down up because if layer one's not up, then layer two can't be up. You can have up down though if for some reason you've got a serial link, one side is HDLC and one side is PPP, or one side's got uh, authentication and the other one doesn't. You may end up with an up down situation. Uh, so layer two being down. This is probably where I start most of my commands just to see what's going on. Then I have other commands like show IP protocols. It shows you your running uh, routing protocols. Shows you what networks you're routing for. Now, what if I wanted to see IPv6 protocols? What would I type in? Anybody? Quite honestly, just take, yeah, show IPv6. Take every one of these commands and just put show IPv6 instead of IP. So you can do IPv6 protocols, show IPv6 route. You've got the show interfaces command that will show you all the interfaces or just a, one interface if you specify it. And that'll show IP interface uh, 00 and show you the mask. I really wish this command showed you the subnet mask. I don't know why it doesn't, but that sure really would be nice if they would write it to do that. Show IP protocol, or show protocol, shows you the protocols that are running. Okay. I don't use that one very much. Show CDP neighbors is pretty cool because you can actually see what's directly connected to you. We'll talk about CDP 
Um, it is a layer two protocol that we talked a little bit about, um, but it runs between Cisco devices and they will share information with each other. So it's a, a, a good thing. Um, it's a little bit of a security hole, but it is nice when you're trying to troubleshoot a network. And then we've got basic, a syntax checker doing the show commands inside of this. Basic switch commands, it's almost the exact same thing for configuration. The only difference is we have to put an IP address on the switch virtual interface instead of on a physical interface. So this is an, what's called an SVI, switch virtual interface. We also have to set a default gateway because we are not a router as a switch and we need to know where to go uh, if we're going outside of our local network. Learned a very interesting thing uh, earlier this week and that is if you're running IPv6 on the switch, you can't set an IPv6 default gateway, but you can set an IPv6 default route on a switch, and that will perform the same function as a default gateway. So I thought that was that was kind of interesting, a little weird aside that we found when I was working with another instructor at another school. Otherwise, same thing, enable secret. Now they put in enable password. I never use the enable password. I always use enable secret. I think pretty much everyone in the real world does too, so I wish they would just stop even showing that command, um, but they show it in there for some reason. And then a copy run start so that we can get it to save to the running, uh, to the start config. If you need to reload a switch, uh, it's erase start config and then delete flash colon VLAN dot dat. Make sure you put this. Don't erase the flash, do delete flash colon vlan.dat and then reload it and that will get rid of all the vlans and it will also get, a, get rid of the startup configuration. Okay. Okay, send it back. So uh, commands on a switch show port security. All right, so we should know about the port security commands and how you set up port security and we'll talk even more about that too. This will show you whether or not port security has been set, what the mode is, whether I got sticky MAC addresses, and we'll, we'll teach you how to do this um, in this class. Show port security uh, addresses. That shows you the ports that are, the MAC addresses that are assigned to the ports via either statically or with uh, sticky. In this case, they're dynamic and sticky. Show interface uh, and the interface ID will tell you about the interface, whether it's up or down. You can also do uh, show MAC address table to show you the MAC addresses that are known on a particular port um, because switches, remember, uh, build tables of MAC addresses. Last but not least, it also supports show CDP neighbors. Um, so it's, it's pretty much the same. It supports the same in-band, out-of-band as a router, except for uh, switches do not typically have an auxiliary port. In fact, I can't say that I've seen one I've seen some modular ones that had an auxiliary port, I believe. Can't don't quote me on that, but I, I can't off the top of my head remember seeing a an auxiliary port on a on a switch. And folks, uh that's pretty much it for this chapter. That's all there is to it. The big takeaways are your hierarchical model. You've got the core, which is designed for high speed um, moving of information. Okay, moving packets at a high speed, uh, routing packets at high speed. You got your distribution layer that is designed more to do your control, uh, your access control list, your VLANs. Um, even some of your inner VLAN routing can take place down here that doesn't need to leave the distribution layer. Um, and then many times we also do uh, aggregation at this layer so we get more speed between the access layers and the distribution layer. And then the access layer is just the on-ramp for devices. So it's what the devices connect directly to. Other than that, uh, it was just a review of how you do a basic router configuration and a basic switch configuration for, uh, for each one of those types of devices. Our next chapter will be VLANs, VTP, uh, extended VLANs and DTP. And that will be chapter two. And then after that, we will move on to, and we'll go ahead and look here, 
Um, we'll be moving on to looking at uh, STP, a full chapter on STP, uh, chapter on the uh, ES, uh, Ether Channel HSRP, dynamic routing. Um, in fact, I might change these names because these names are wrong, uh, but we will, we will, um, no, these are right. We will get these uh, single area OSPF, multi area OSPF, and EIGRP. So these are all topics that we will hit as we go through this course. Are there any questions as we kind of wrap up for today? It's a short day today, a little bit shorter than normal, only 35, 40 minutes. But I am here to ask any questions you may have. Any questions after recording? Okay. Hold on one second. I will stop the recording. The recording is.